Hello everyone, welcome to this FMB webinar. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us today, whether you're a, a first time webinar attendee or one of our members who attends regularly, it's really great to have you with us this afternoon. So um, we've been running a series of webinars just recently aimed at builders who either are or would like to become uh, property developers. So a couple of webinars ago, we had a presentation on the Construction Leadership Council's Guide to Becoming a Developer, which if you haven't had a chance to check that out yet and you are interested, I would encourage you to go onto the FMB website and have a look at that, still available to view, and uh, the guide along with the webinar that we did to accompany it, which are really packed full of useful practical information as well. So do have a look at that. Um, this again is on the subject of development and today we have two speakers with us um, from, we have Paul Davis and Janet Bailey from the National Brownfield Institute, which is based at Wolverhampton University, and they're going to talk a bit about how they can support SME builders um, with brownfield development projects. So before we get started with that, just to um, do some housekeeping for you, we uh, if you have any questions at all that occur to you as we go through the webinar, just pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we'll answer those at the end after the presentation. Um, we should be through the session in about 45 minutes, including questions and answers at the end, um, depending how many questions that we get. And you will receive a follow up email after the webinar, which will have uh, links to the recording of the webinar and copies of the presentation slides and any other information that we've referred to during the webinar. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is ask you some questions so that it will help um, Paul and Janet to understand our audience a bit and to know where where you're at with all of this. Um, so the first question that we're going to ask of the audience is, have you previously built on a brownfield site? So um, I'll give you a, a second or two to answer that question. And then I will share the answers in a moment. So at the moment, it's looking like a bit of each. I'm going to share the results on the screen now, and you can see that most of you haven't, 71% attending say so no, they haven't developed on a brownfield site before, but uh, about a third of you have. So thank you for doing that. One more question for you. For those who have um, developed a brownfield site before, we'd just like to know what the impact of that was on the project. So there's the question on the screen now, did that delay the project? increase the costs of the project? Did it have a positive impact on the project as a whole or didn't have any impact? So I'll leave that on the screen for you for a moment. Okay, so it looks like everybody's had a chance to put their answer in now, so I'll share that. And it looks like for some it has a positive impact and for some, uh, it has increased the costs of the project. So that's really useful for us to know. Thank you for that. Just go back and close that poll now. So now I'm going to hand over to Paul and Jan for their presentation. And um, as I say, any questions, pop them in the Q&A box. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Um, we're live on this now. So we're just going to share our screen. My name is Paul Davis, and this is my colleague Janet Bailey from the National Brown Institute and Brownfield Institute. You want to share the screen, and I'll pick it up. Yeah. Okay. Um, Perfect. We can see that clearly now. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, we're both knowledge transfer managers for the National Brownfield Institute and the School of Architecture and Built Environment. Um, what does that mean? Well, we work with um, businesses and the business community 
to help to bring brainfield back into economic use. And that can be from the brainfield site or the construction side. So for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to talk through an overview of the Springfield site where we're based, a little bit about the National Brainfield Institute and brownfield sites, what that means for businesses um, and opportunities that, that um, run alongside that, the equipment and services that we offer, uh, the st strategic approach, a summary, and we're going to end with Q&As. So I'll start off with our Springfield campus. Uh, this is very close to Wolverhampton City Centre. It was the old Springfield Brewery site, M&B Brewery site, um, until about 1991 when it was vacated and very swiftly became a derelict site. So um, we have developed a brownfield site, so we're a wonderful case study for that. So there was a... Um, a fire on the site in about 2004. In 2014, the University of Wolverhampton bought the site and started the development. Um, obviously, challenges there. They began by building the Elite Centre for Manufacturing Skills, and that was swiftly followed by the School of Architecture and Built Environment, which is the, uh, the beautiful building that you can see there. And we also have Thomas Telford University Technical College on this site, and of course the National Brownfield Institute, where we're going to focus today. So the National Brownfield Institute's vision is exactly what it says there, to create a world-class brownfield regeneration industry cluster, working with multi-sector partnerships, um, and all based at the, the Springfield site as our central hub. So why do we want to develop brownfield site? Well, the answers are pretty straightforward, really. It reduces the use of greenfield sites. It also eliminates some of those blots on the landscape um, and encourages redevelopment, as it did with our Springfield site here, which we're hoping that many of you will visit. Um, the development of brownfield sites brings its own social and economic benefits, um, and, and that's around employment land. So it's not just about building those um, employment builds, but it's also around the employment opportunities that the development itself offers um, to use local skills, local SMEs. Um, so so it, it's the whole thing there. Um, also on the housing side, on the residential side, it helps the councils to meet their targets around residential builds, but it also helps to prevent some of that um, urban sprawl, so you're not just bits popping up all over the place. Um, and it's a sustainable urban development. It increases the green space. Um, from the social side, there, there's lots of social um, benefits there. So naturally, wherever there are developments, there, there's an increase um, in, in benefits economically and socially. There are some incentives there, including the Brownfield Land Release Fund and also, also Brownfield tax credits. Um, the, hopefully there'll be more on the way. So there's obviously lots of benefits um, there to developing Brownfield land. So why is it so challenging? Well, it, in many ways, um, you know, Greenfield land is, is easier to develop because you can calculate your profit very easily by, you know, potentially what your sales value is, then you deduct the cost of your land, the cost of your build, and that gives you your, your profit. Brownfield land brings in the element of the unknown. So you've got your sales value minus your land and build costs, but also potentially then um, a remediation cost. So there's an uncertainty there, uh, so that can impact on your on your profit. So you need to start looking at contingencies. So really, it's the unknowns that create the challenge. So the question is, can we control the unknowns? Um, in in some ways, yet, because um, if we know what's happened in the past, the the start you can start to build that picture start to look at the potential risk there. So for instance, um, if you had something like light industrial builds previously, that's probably quite a low contamination risk. 
But if you're looking at um, a gas works or a steel works there previously, that could be a high, very high contamination risk and obviously associated costs. Um, is there is there a, a water risk there? You know, are the aquifers or controlled waters, etc. Um, and, and what's the proposed end use? Does that source source pathway receptor route um, meet the needs of whether it's public open spaces, employment, commercial land, or residential land? Um, the problem with the information around brownfill sites is that very often it's not available early enough in that decision making process. Um, or it's just not comprehensive enough. There's, uh, it, there's just not enough information there. Maybe it's not accurate. Maybe it's not up to date. Um, and sometimes it's quite difficult to access. So it's not all in one place. And in many ways, that's what the, Brown, the National Brownfield Institute wants to try to overcome is start to bring those businesses, those partnerships with that information in, into one central place. Um, that then starts to impact on the cost so if you know that it's low, remedi low re remediation cost, you can start to factor that in there. So you start to remove some of those unknowns. You start to get a little more certainty. You can start to make your contingency plans. You know the types of site investigation potentially that you'll need. Is it just a preliminary check? Do you need something more detailed? And then you can start to look at what that remediation may involve um, and look at potentially some of the costs associated with that. So one of the ways that we've started to look at this is our Brownfield database. And at the moment, this is a database of Black Country Brownfield sites. And the information has been sourced from open access data, which is the Brownfield registers for the Black Country. Um, but we've um, put it into one database so that we can filter it and work with it, manipulate it, um, so that particular sites can be identified by criteria and ranked in a particular order. So that could be um, size of the land, location, connectivity. And we've also started to build in some historical information in that. And that goes back to that controlling the unknowns. When you can start to build a picture of, of what was there previously, you can start to make a plan for development and remediation. Um, it gives you, tells you what that potential contamination might be, and it helps you to build a more accurate risk assessment. The next steps for that are uh, to start to build in approximate costs around potential remediation and to, and to maybe more proactively um, identify brownfield sites. Uh, to, to actually contact 300 plus local authorities for their open access data is quite onerous um, and probably the reason that we don't have that centralized database. So we want to look at it, you know, using algorithms, programming. Can we use Google Earth, Google Maps, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of information there, but what does that mean for businesses? When we... Um, obtained the funding for the National Brownfield Institute, we made a commitment that we would support several hundreds of SMEs um, for a period of 12 hours, which is funded support, so free at the point of delivery. Um, and what can that involve? Well, we've got fantastic modern facilities here. So we've got some immersive spaces, which Paul will go um, through in a little more detail but we've also got fantastic networking space seminar rooms boardrooms um, meeting spaces and that can all be used as part of that 12 hours of support so we can do bespoke business support if you want something very specific we can have a conversation to see if we can deliver that we've got access into our academics so um, that that's that's sort of that one-to-one -one, um information really that can help us build a picture of what that support might look like. We've got lots of fantastic state-of-the-art equipment. Again, Paul is going to go through that with you. Knowledge transfer opportunities, which would be brownfield-related expertise, or um, just developing a company's knowledge around what that brownfield development process looks like. We've got state-of-the-art laboratories, uh, and we're looking at research and innovation um, around groundwater uh, and soil testing facilities. 
So I think at that point, I'll hand across to Paul to tell you about um, what some of that means. Thanks, Jan. That's great. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to start to talk to you about um, the equipment and some of the services we've got on offer at the National Brownfield Institute and also the strategic approach of, of the MBI. And I'm going to start with uh, the largest piece of equipment we've got, which is that on the screen, which is our Igloo Shared Immersive Space. Now, it's a bit hard to describe um, in words. You really need to see it, but it's the it's the closest thing you'll get to a VR scenario, but without having to wear the headset. So 30 people can share this immersive space together and it's it's the largest example of its kind in europe and again it's available to, to to you guys to use if you need to for for that amazing product launch or to have an event and you you can use this you can use this space and we can help you create the content for it I'll just move to the next slide. And that's, that's another example of, of uh, what it looks like from inside. So that particular example on the screens there is a video of an architect's um, in, impression of, of a site that was going to be developed, a brownfield site that was going to be developed. And it's, 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 their, it's their imagery that they wanted, to, they wanted to convey to their clients. We also have in the National Brownfield Institute um, igloo's baby brother which is um the same igloo technology but in a small in a small space and this is this is our immersive room so this could be for that for that planning meeting and where you've got an, a group of people around a table and you can fill the walls with your content it could be different designs it could be different options or whatever whatever you would you, you would want to use for your for your meeting and mo moving on to my personal favorite in terms of our equipment and this is this is our robot and it's not just any old robot this is this is spot from boston dynamics it's the the most sophisticated quadruped robot on the planet as i say developed by boston dynamics and you may wonder why why we've got one well brownfield sites can be dangerous they can be contaminated they can have they can have unsafe buildings but yet you need to gather the data on that building or on that site before, before you can remediate or develop it. So Spot can, can carry different payloads. For example, it can carry a LIDAR scanning device. So you can send the robot into the building to carry out the survey, leaving the human being safe outside, and, and the robot will, will gather the data necessary for for, for uh, remediation and identification of that site the, the robot can can be automated so for example if you wanted to scan um, a particular building under construction every day at five o'clock you can you can automate that routine and the robot can go in it can navigate any objects that weren't there the day before it's got a very sophisticated collision avoidance system it can go up and down stairs and it can avoid obstacles as they as, as they appear, and it can carry payloads of up to up to about four, fourteen kilograms. And the next next slides show you some of our reality capture equipment. Now we've invested in the very latest in in reality capture or lidar scanning devices at the National Bradford Institute, and traditional um, lidar scanners will be uh, tripod mounted. So they'll sit on a tripod and you'll, you, would, you would put it in a building and the device would spin on its tripod, sending a laser out millions of times a second, taking the measurements. It would then spin again and create, capture all the, the photographic imagery. You would then move position and repeat. And that repetition for a, for a building of the, the size we're in now might take, for example, 10 hours. But with the two devices on the screen that can reduce that time by a, by a factor of 10. So you can do the same, gather the same imagery and data in about 10% of the time, because these devices, the Leica BLK to go and the Navis VLX are, are aware of their location. 
So you don't have to keep stopping. You can just literally walk around the building with the devices and it captures the data. There's a small payback in terms of accuracy. The, the, the terrestrial laser scanner we have is around about four millimeters accuracy. These two devices range between six and 10 millimeter accuracy. So yes, a small payback in that, but a massive reduction in time. And in, if, if you want to gather that data quickly, these are the devices that, that, that would do that. And again, that's something we, we can offer as a service for, for, from the MBI. And the kind of output you would get from, from these, these devices is, is, is this point cloud data. Now, what you're looking at there is the National Brownfield Institute under construction. So you can see this, it's the building in the left-hand image, it's the building on the left. The right-hand image with the sawtooth roof is, is a School of Architecture building. And as you can see, the National Brownfield Institute is, is under construction. The, the steel frames have gone up and that's imagery is created with a, with, a, with a laser scanning device. And that's the kind of act that we would give you if you, if you asked us to do that for your business. And you can measure between any two points within that, within that digital model. But the point cloud data can also be used to create floor plans, BIM models, and 3D visualizations. Uh, mo moving on now, I'm going to talk about our strategic approach of the of the MBI. So Jan's mentioned that we, we're mandated to provide support to business, and we are. We've got to support, provide support to hundreds of business over, over the next few years. But we're also mandated to influence um, brownfield land being remediated and houses built on brownfield land. And to do that, we've, we have to work with, with some larger organisations such as Wolverhampton City Council, we're working with Homes England, and we're working with Legal and General Modular Homes, who uh, are, are building, uh, are hoping to build a number of hundreds of modular houses for for um, Wolverhampton City Council. So again, if we can work with these people, we can we can work with their supply chains and we can support their supply chains who may may not have come across brownfield sites before, and we can offer that expertise and reassurances on on how, how that development work can take place. And also, I'd like to like to mention the the fact that the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, or, or DLUC, were the first uh, central government department to move out of out of Whitehall, and they've moved to Wolverhampton, which is fantastic news for us. But that really isn't a coincidence either, because as Jan was saying, on our on our campus here, we've got a twelve acre campus with a school of architecture with the National Brownfield Institute. We've also got a university technical college for 11 to 18 year olds, which is construction focused. So we're Wolverhampton, in Wolverhampton, we're trying to create a, a reputation for all things construction and a center of excellence for construction. And I think DLUC moving into the city has, has, has helped us with, with, that, uh, with, that, with that narrative. And finally, in, in, in summary, I just wanted to, to to remind you all that we're here to support businesses. We have we have been given uh, leveling up funds, and the payback for that is we've got to help small to medium sized enterprises. So all of the things Jan and I have spoken about this this fantastic venue, which we'd invite any of you to come and have a look at, all of the equipment and services we've got, they can be made available to to, to you as a small to medium sized enterprise. So that that can be. Um, the building, which is great for event space with meeting rooms, will help you create some content for the igloo to make your make your event really stand out from the crowd. So if you've got that big product launch or that really important meeting, come and hold it in the igloo. We've got fantastic communications in the area. We're, we're just a few minutes walk from the train station. We've got hundreds of car parking spaces with electric car chargers. We really are a great venue right in the middle of the country, which is easy to get to. And uh, as I say, we've got the latest in equipment. We can offer knowledge transfer, seminars, workshops, and networking, and research and innovation. And we would encourage you to uh, to, to make contact with us. And you'll see our our contact details are up on the screen. I'm sure Hayley will will circulate that to to, to you all as well at the end of at the end of the event. And uh, that I'd just like to say thank you very much. That's that's our presentation complete. Thanks, Paul. 
So it sounds like all roads lead to Wolverhampton. By the yeah. sounds of it, which is great. Um, just as you were speaking there, I, I was wondering about the 12 hours of bespoke business support that Janet spoke about. Can you give us any kind of examples of what that might look like? What sort of support you'd be offering? And, and uh, do you have any case studies that you could briefly share with us? Anything like that? I mean, sure, it, it's many and varied. So, so it could be as simple as you would like a LIDAR scan of a building. So we can we can go to site. And I, I'd just like to remind people that we can help people anywhere in the UK as well. We're not restricted geographically. So it doesn't matter where your business is located in the UK. We, we can support you and a lot of projects are are restricted, but we, we aren't. So it could be as simple as a LIDAR survey, or it could be um, you want to hold a seminar in, a, in our building or an event in our building. I don't know whether you want to. Um, yeah, I think well. um, I suppose some of the examples that I would give is, is around sort of business development as well, where some, some companies literally just want us to want to have the conversations, want us to signpost them. To, to relevant support if it's there. But also um, from that research point is um, sort of what, what's the difference between maybe traditional build and modular build? What are the advantages, the disadvantages? Um, so it, it, it can be anything and very varied. And if you, if you follow the link on our, on our website, uh, Hayley, that, that will give you some examples of, of the sort of thing we, we can do as well. Okay, um, so we've got a couple of questions coming into the Q&A box. Somebody's asked whether they can visit the National Brownfield Institute, which from what you've said, you would, you would encourage visitors. Um, somebody do. else has also asked how you access support. And I guess the first step to that might be to contact, use the contact details that we'll share with members yes. after the webinar. Yeah. And you've said as well that the support covers the whole of the UK, so that includes Scotland from for members up there as well. I think okay. maybe just get if they just referenced that it was from the seminar, from the FMB seminar, then we'll have a point of reference. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we're already working with businesses in Scotland and yeah. and the southeast of England, so and everywhere in between. Yeah. Do, do you have any tips or information on for for our members who are developers on how they would find a good brownfield site to develop? Because ahead of this webinar, I thought I'd have a look at the um, the local authorities brownfield register where I live, which is in York. And there's loads. I was surprised how many sites there are in York, actually, brownfield sites. But they all seem to already be, have planning permission and already have a developer in place. So I was wondering, how do, would you find out about sites that are ripe for development but haven't yet got a developer working on them? Do you have you got any thoughts about that? I, I think that that's that's more difficult, obviously, um, because um, obviously the first point of reference would be that brownfield register. Um, I think what I'd say is if there's something that's interesting there, have a case study in place for the council because very often they'll want to know that you're you're ready and prepared for that, that financially you can sustain that development. Um, so your, your business case is, is prepared. But for actually finding the sites, um, that's exactly what the problem is across the UK, is that there are lots of sites there, but it's pages and pages. And if you think this is for each authority, it's quite difficult to wade through. And there are a lot, but it's sifting out where those particular sites are uh, mm -hmm. I suppose what we've done in the black country is filter that down and we have direct contacts in with the council so we can say are these still available because the brownfield registers aren't always up to date yeah and, and one of the things that um, one of the practical tips in the CLC developer guide that we talked about in a previous webinar was around that local knowledge and talking to estate agents and your local authorities and other people who will have that knowledge. So maybe that's the, the way to go. I can just add to that, Hayley. I think um, what, as Janet said, we've developed an index for the black country, which is, which is in the thousands of sites just for the black country. And we hope to employ uh, a researcher, at least one researcher to carry on that research and expand it beyond the black country. But that's no mean feat. People have tried to do this for decades 
page to actually create a brand, an all encompassing brownfield register. And no one's ever managed to finish it because it's, it, it's one of those things once you've started, you've got to go back and update it because usage changes, et cetera. But um, if, if we can get the right researchers in place, that is something we intend to, we intend mm. to work on. But at the moment, we're a brand new project. We started last September, opened last September. Yeah. And that's something we, we aim to do. And yeah. ultimately try to influence policy because, you know, it's health authorities don't even, I mean, they have to record what's what the information they're given, but it's not all recorded in exactly the same way. So it's it's to almost get a standardization would yeah. be perfect. And then the information's fed into a central point and, and then it's legislated that that has to be updated on a regular basis. I think that's a long way down the road, but ideally that would be what that, that Brownfield database will look like. Okay. Well, you just mentioned policy issues. So we've got a, a question here that relates to that. So Chris is asking, one of the biggest issues with brownfield developments going forward will be to try to achieve biodiversity net gain on those sites. Will you be campaigning to have those sites exempted? Exempted from having to? Yeah, I think that's... Biodiversity net gain. I, I don't think they'd be exempted because it's it's now... Um, you know, sort of that's the way that the government's going to go with that. I think, again, I'd go for a standardisation because different councils can can ask for different percentages in that formula. So it's um, sort of a more standard approach to it so that if a business wants to develop in, in, in more than just one area, so local knowledge is great, but once you start to grow your business, you, you're probably going to want to go out of area, out of region. Um, and, and suddenly then you've got to get the same information. If you, if, if everybody's is standardized with that, it would work, but it's not always the same everywhere you go. I think as well in terms of the, the offsetting um, of the land, which, which is, is, is still a possibility, is land is different cost. So if you say, for instance, um, purchased a, a site in Buckinghamshire, but you wanted to offset your biodiversity net gain, would you look at a cheaper area to offset in? So you're not having to, you know, so I mean, that's not ethical, but I think that's what we need to make sure that that's not happening. So where your offset is, is in the area that you develop. Does that answer, does that answer your question? Well, I hope it does answer Chris's question. Um, yeah, did you have anything to add, Paul, to that? Well, not, not really. Other than, other than this needs to be a, a nationally led uh, conversation, and we need some, some guidance from central government rather than, as Jan was saying, different local authority areas doing their own thing. Yeah, we need some sort of a nas national policy on this, yeah. which there isn't at the moment. Okay, so another question from Annie. Um, if a company wanted more than 12 hours of support, what would be the costs for that going on beyond the 12 hours? Is that something you would look at? Yeah, you... we, we, um, we'd, we'd rarely, we don't stop at 12, put it that way. We, 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 12 is the minimum we've got to give you. So um, we can't go on forever, but if if it's, if it's 20 hours, so be it. Um, it would depend on what you came to, came to ask us for. But each company can only get one um, package of support off us. But there are ways in where we can do events where that, that, could, be, that could be replicated. But that's something we'd need to talk to you about on an individual basis. Mm. But we never stop at 12. And also, I think when I mentioned the signposting, to um, other support. There are lots of pockets of 12 hours of support around. So it, it may be that we can signpost them to other areas of, of an additional 12 hours of support. Sometimes well, that's geographically restricted and sometimes not. So I think it's just um, having those yeah. conversations directly. Yeah, you mean perhaps things like growth hubs and in um, different areas that have got funding. Well, for, for instance, for us, um, we've got our school of architecture and built environment and you can get an additional 12, 12 hours of support 
from there, but that does have um, more geographical geographic restrictions or we've got our elite center for manufacturing and that has another 12 hours of support mm -hmm. so it just depends having that conversation to see where the best use of that that space is so it could be that they actually start their 12 hours of support with our school and then move to their 12 hours with us but, but you yeah. would advise them on on the best yeah. of way. course of course yeah we'll make sure they get the the most bang for their buck for sure yeah Okay, so we have another question here from Todd. So Todd's asking for the services that you offer, is there a minimum or maximum size for the Brownfield site? Brownfield site? That's a good question. I hadn't thought of that. Is it just any Brownfield site or are you looking particularly yeah. at the smaller sites? I mean, we, our site, our support doesn't have to necessarily revolve around a particular site. So to answer that question, yes any site it doesn't matter if it's been built on before it's brownfield therefore you know we can support you around it but the support might not be around a brownfield site it might be you want an mm. event to publish to publicize your new product if you're in the construction industry and you've invented a new widget you might want to launch that widget in our center here using our igloo so no brownfield site involved but you might be supplying that widget into future brownfield sites Okay, and I, th I think to sort of, I suppose, qualify some of that as well. I mean, if it's an enormous site, I mean, we, we've got twelve areas, and we're we're always we're always going to go over a little more. But if it starts to fall into an area that we can't support, it may be that we start the initial process, so that helps in the decision making to decide whether they want to take further paid for support. Hmm. And I guess if if you're looking to support SMEs, it's unlikely they're going to be developing absolutely, absolutely yeah. sites, isn't it? So yeah. And often you can use us as a try before you buy. I mean, we're we're, we're working with a company who are thinking about buying a Boston Dynamics robot, but that's that's a they start at a hundred thousand dollars, so it's a big big investment, and they want to use it for scanning construction sites. So we're going to take our robot and our scanning device to one of their sites and to and to and to try their process using our equipment. And if they like it, then they can invest with confidence. If they don't like it, they don't need to waste their money. Hmm. I'd love to see that dog in action. <laughs> you must visit us. Come see us. <laughs> OK, well, I can't see if there are any more questions that anybody wants to pop in the box just quickly before we uh, before we close up. That'd be great. Um, but it doesn't look like there are any more questions coming through. So, as I said, we'll send the follow up email that will have the link to the recording of the webinar and the copy of the slides, which has your contact details in it. Um, so. We will. Oh, there we are. The thank you for attending slide has popped up. We've got another webinar and I can't remember the date of it, but I know that our next webinar, we're going to be talking about, ah, oh, there you are. We've got some events details popping up on the screen, but we're going to be having a webinar in March, which is all going to be about um, well-being and work-life balance. So that's obviously important for everybody to bear in mind. And we can see the upcoming events there. The South and Central Master Builder Awards are coming up very soon. So if you haven't yet got a ticket for that and you'd like to attend, then you know uh, where to go on the website, email events at fmb.org.uk um, for that. And for any ideas that you might have about future webinars that you'd like to see us running. But otherwise, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Paul and Jan for today's presentation. That was really fascinating. And um, thank you to everybody who's attended this afternoon as well. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.